My name is Michael Goldberg. For those um, that I haven't met before, I'm the executive director of our Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case and also um, teach at Weatherhead, teach courses on entrepreneurship. And it's great to have Chad Zimmerman as part of our entrepreneurship speaker series, which we've been doing via Zoom and Facebook Live for a little while now, just given things that are happening, although both of us are sitting in the greater Cleveland area. So, um, Chad, thank you for, for doing this today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Katarina, who's our student moderator. All of our sessions um, that we do as part of this series are moderated by students, which is great, which means that Doug and I do a lot less work and we can enjoy the conversation. Um, so if you can let, for those of you that are on Zoom, um, just let Katarina know um, your question. Um, we have a, a relatively small group on Zoom, so we'd love for you to, um, if you're comfortable, just ask the question directly, just let Katarina know. And if you're on Facebook Live, just um, put a comment, uh, a question in the, um, in the chat on Facebook, and then we'll let Katarina know the question. And um, yeah, this is the time that we're all um, stuck in front of our laptops doing Zoom. It's awesome to be able to, to welcome in entrepreneurs to kind of hear their story and have conversations. So Katerina, Chad, thank you for doing this. And I'll turn it over to Katerina. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, so I'm Katie Stegman. I'm um, a rising fourth year studying psychology and environmental studies. Um, so I deal a lot with a lot of very um, sort of important social issues in my schoolwork. So I'm really excited to have this conversation today with Chad. Um, not only are we going to be able to get his expertise on, you know, starting not just one, but two businesses. Um, and, you know, he's really, I think, spanned a sort of a um, wide variety, I guess, of industries and can speak to that. Um, but we're also going to hear um, a very interesting perspective on, you know, in this time, how we can um, really start to deal with the social impact of, you know, COVID-19 and, and the wide host of social issues that we face in our society. So um, thank you, Chad, for being here with me. Um, thank you, Michael and Doug, for setting this up. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Chad, to like introduce yourself and maybe tell us a little bit about your path to um, getting to where you are now. Sure, happy to. Yeah, so thank you, everybody. Um, so Chad Zimmerman here, um, as, as uh, Michael hit on, I'm a native Clevelander here um, and been a serial digital entrepreneur really through my career. Um, I'll give you a little bit of that background and how it weaves into these two different stories. So um, after graduating from high school here in the Cleveland area, I went to Carnegie Mellon, I'm a chemical engineer by education, but never really used that degree. Uh, was also a member of their varsity football team. And that's really where the first business idea came, um, where as an athlete, I was looking for proper health, fitness, nutrition information to become a better athlete. Um, really struggled to find that information from reputable sources. Teammates had the same stories and that's where the light bulb went off. Like maybe there's an opportunity to build a business to be the, the athlete's information source, to get the, the best and safest information to athletes, help them avoid steroids, um, and, and make sure they get the most out of their sports career. So while getting my degree in chemical engineering, I also started taking a bunch of business courses for my electives and uh, did some independent study projects as well and wrote the business plan for what ultimately became Stack Media. And so um, I graduated in, in May of 04. Um, and by February of 05, had raised a few million dollars and launched uh, the first issue. It started as a print publication. It shows you how old I am. We did things in print when we first started. Um, but the magazine was requested by high school athletic directors for their student athletes. Um, and we did some initial test marketing to about 6,000 high schools and the 50 largest uh, DMAs. And 50% of them said yes at 100 copies per school. And we had a circulation of over 300,000 almost overnight. Um, got LeBron James on our first cover, got Nike and Reebok and Rawlings to buy ads in the first issue and uh, kind of away we went and, and building stack. And over the next uh, 12 years um, until 2017, we continued to build that business until we were acquired um, by a company called Blue Star Sports, which was backed by Jerry Jones, the Dallas Cowboys owner, hence the Blue Star name, uh, if you're familiar with the Cowboys logo. And, um, and Stack was one of about two dozen companies that were acquired by Blue Star in a roll up. And um, you know, along the way, we became one of the top 10 largest digital sports properties in the US. We were reaching tens of millions of unique visitors and had you know, partnerships with Nike and Gatorade and Under Armour and Asics and all the sort of endemic sports brands and worked with 
Peyton Manning and Derek Jeter and Chris Paul and all kinds of sports stars where they shared their techniques for getting better at sport and, and helped you know, millions of high school athletes across the country get better at sports. Um, so from there, and, and I'll, I'll preface this, that this was like, we, we started what I would call a very purpose-driven organization before we really knew we were starting a purpose-driven organization, but we, we didn't start the company because we were passionate writers. We didn't start the company because we wanted to make sure Gatorade had another way to sell sports drinks, right? We, we just, we wanted to help our fellow athletes that really were passionate about getting better. Um, we knew that current professional athletes, many of them cared about how they could give back to the next generation of athletes. And we created a vehicle to make it possible for them to do that. Um, and so uh, it wasn't labeled that, we didn't think about it, but looking back, we certainly recognized it was very much a purpose-driven uh, company that we started. So then after um, Stack was acquired, I exited shortly thereafter, uh, started doing a lot of consulting for companies, trying to figure out their digital strategies, anything from, content marketing and uh, customer acquisition to revenue strategies because we did everything from the advertising and sponsorship to custom app development to direct to consumer lead generation all sorts of different business models we kind of had through our stack ecosystem so i could consult on all of those and on a shared client up in toronto i met who uh Heider nazar who became my co-founder in maha um, and Hyder was uh, working on this client as what he was calling impact management consulting. Um, he had a background in, in management consulting, ex Accenture guy, as well as a digital entrepreneur, but he was helping business leaders discover what's their purpose beyond profit and helping management make a business case for purpose and, and then how that would start to show up in their strategies for how they would grow the business. And I thought that was really fascinating. Um, but he had a challenge, as most consultants do, that they can only work with so many people within an organization. And there's only so many hours in the day. And asked, you know, if the real, what's the real power behind this? And it was very much not just that senior leadership was bought into it, but that the broader workforce was bought into it. And they felt they were in a position to um, actively participate in, in supporting that, that higher purpose for the organization. And um, he didn't have a, a means for solving it. And I thought about what we've been doing at Stack and creating instructional content using digital as a way to disseminate that information. And, uh, you know, we were saying, hey, here's what the top athletes and experts, strength coaches for the Yankees or the Lakers were doing. And now we're going to use content and media to get that out to the masses. Could we do something within the corporate environment that's similar? So the, you're an expert, Hyder, and here's what you've been teaching to the most you know, the highest rungs of that organization, can we use digital and content and data to get this information out to the masses and enroll the broader workforce? And so that was sort of the, the meeting of our past experiences to then create Maha to help businesses better, um, not just adopt, but then actualize their purpose uh, through engaging their employees. And so that uh, we came together in the summer of 2018, so not quite two years ago, it was towards the end of that summer. Um, and what's, what's evolved in, in Maha is really, it's, it's evolved more into a data play, I'll say, in that and helping to quantify the health of purpose within an organization, largely based on employee reported metrics, um, their, their clarity, their alignment, and their enablement around the ability to carry out their corporate purpose. And so we've been building uh, various tools to capture that information, process it, and then provide insights back to organizations so they understand that. So we've done uh, um, you know, an initial pilot with, with Pfizer and we're in talks about doing some, some larger rollouts with them and then some other large Fortune 500 sorts of organizations I'm not at liberty to name, but that are looking at doing similar, similar projects. So that's hopefully that 10 minute rambling is a, a good basis for you, for you to understand what I've, what I've been up to. That's awesome, thank you. Um, so something that um, I think you mentioned earlier in that, so me and Chad had a short conversation a few weeks back about you know, his um, history was that, um, you know, you mentioned that you started your first company with support um, a certain way from your undergraduate institution. Um, so I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that process was like um, and how that support was helpful to you um, and whether you would recommend um, to like another current student or maybe a um, soon to be a graduate um, to whether you would recommend starting a business at that stage in their life? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great question. Um, so the short answer is absolutely leverage your university. I mean, this is not, you know, might seem like it's like, oh, I'm pandering to the case Western folks that are here. But I mean, that was 
critical for our success. As I said, I was getting a degree in chemical engineering. There really weren't business classes that were mandated as part of that uh, curriculum, but I had electives and um, I started taking courses that were specific to starting businesses so I could start learning that. And then there was um, the Donald Jones Center for Entrepreneurship. Now it's the Swartz Center for Entrepreneurship over at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon. I reached out to uh, the head of that at the time was Art Bonney and now it's um, Dave Mawinney. But um, the folks you have here on Zoom with you, right? Successful entrepreneurs who know this space. I let them know what my idea was. I, they were, I actually was able to set up half of my course load. My second semester of my senior year was an independent study project working on Stack. And I had the head of the entrepreneurship uh, center as my advisor. I was able to bring in other students who were student athletes, essentially. So I had a focus group to share ideas and get bounced back of what they were, what they needed. Um, and, and still keep in touch with uh, Professor Bonnie to this day you know, some 20 years since I started at CMU. Um, so the, the network that you have there and the willingness of these folks to support you and then to make connections and open doors is just tremendous. And it's, it's somewhat cliche around, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know, sort of a thing. But connections and warm intros so that somebody responds to an email because somebody's making that introduction is still a critical part of any business. And, and so tapping into folks who, who know you, who trust you, can kind of vouch for you and make those warm intros. Um, the, the, the different professors and other folks involved with your university are just tremendous resources. And I did a good amount of, of that, right, obviously, but looking back, I wish I would have done more, right? And because and, I didn't realize then how valuable it would be. And I still reach back out to Carnegie Mellon now and, and, and get connections through that. So definitely leverage that. Awesome. That's great advice. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So uh, I wonder if you could tell us also a little bit about your experience transitioning um, a business from sort of like a print um, based medium to um, something that really was becoming maybe more of a digital space and what you learned from that experience. Sure, sure. So um, and that's part of I've, I've given some talks <laughs> where about just the disruptions and the challenges that are going to happen, the external things that happen when you're running a business that are just outside of your control and how you adapt to them. And when we ran, so you're seeing that right now, like what COVID-19 can do to a business, um, what uh, greater lens on inclusive work environments and just being more conscious of how your, what your hiring practices are. Um, so this is always going to happen with your business, right? And there's an, either, it's either going to be an opportunity or a threat to you, right? And, and when we were running Stack, we, um, we had three uh, very big ones that we dealt with. Um, first was the digital disruption, right? We, we started as a print media company and within a year or two after that, all kinds of major brands, magazines, newspapers were all getting shuttered as people were consuming more content on, on the web. You know, then in 2008, when smartphones came out, people were starting to consume content from their phones. Um, and unfortunately, we, we did not fall into the trap of thinking our expertise was putting ink on paper and mailing it to people, which unfortunately, a lot of print media companies, that's what they thought they knew how to do. They didn't view themselves strongly enough, in my opinion, as they were um, content creators and information providers, and digital just provided another channel to distribute your content and your information and to even reach more people faster and more cost effectively than you could through print. So um, we looked at it immediately as this is an opportunity. You're spending a day with a, you know, Dwayne Wade on the basketball court and in the weight room. Why wouldn't you want to bring video cameras with you? Why wouldn't you want to actually record that and then to be able to put that up on the web and be able to show people what those workouts look like? listen to the interviews. It, it was just, it was a richer experience and a complimentary experience to what we could do in print, which, um, so for us, that was a very natural way to expand. For others, it was scary because they didn't know what to do there. And their, the fact that they owned their own printing presses, they thought was their competitive advantage over uh, other folks. So um, they were scared to, to adapt or it was just, it was too challenging because they were too big of a barge to move that quickly. Um, so that's, that's one. The other disruption we had was at the end of 2008 into 2009 with the financial meltdown, right? And we were at a point where we were actually, um, we had just raised around and we thought we were going to be going through, uh, some sort of an M&A event, right? And we were spending and trying to grow rather aggressively to maximize the, the value of the company as we're going into that. Um, and had actually 
we'd hired an investment banker and we had sent out our banker's book and had indications of interest in that we'd sent out that, that banker's book at the end of August. Um, and things were looking okay through the first part of September, but by the end of September and in October, the world just collapsed. And um, we had to reinvent essentially our, our P&L and our budgets because we, we were spending in a way where our time horizon was not meant to be self-sufficient. It was rapid growth and, and show that growth potential so somebody will pay a premium to acquire the business. And um, so that was, that was a challenge and really forced you to be a, a, a great communicator to your team because everybody was scared of, are we going to go under like everybody else? And um, what's going on? And if we, where we had to make cuts, we communicated when, you know, we were going to ha have multiple rounds or whatever it would be of, of layoffs. Like, here's what we're going to do. And here's how, what our plan is. Um, but you had to find a way to right the ship and right size your business to that. And then the, the third was towards the tail end. Um, we were primarily an advertising based business. Uh, if you've learned about any of this, you've probably heard the, the term, the, the digital duopoly, but that's Google and, and Facebook. Um, at their peak, uh, they were controlling, depending on what you read, anywhere from 75 to 90 cents of every ad dollar spent digitally was going to those two companies. Um, so the rest of the pie, the other, call it 25 cents of every dollar spent was going to every other media site you went to, ESPN, Sports Illustrated, you know, CNN. They were fighting over those scraps. Um, Amazon's come in and chewed up a little bit of that. So I think like the duopoly is at around like 60 something percent now. But um, where we saw the, the need for a Nike or a Gatorade to buy their advertising through us because we provided a very direct way to reach you know, 12 to 24 year, old, 24 year old athletes. You can go on to a Facebook or a Google and say, I want to reach people of this age who are interested in these sports and are looking for nutrition information, right? They had all the data and they could target the ads. So that's where we started to then add direct to consumer uh, offerings and subscription areas so we could diversify our, um, our, our revenue streams because we knew we weren't going to be able to live entirely off of advertising because the majority of those dollars are going to those two other companies. Um, and in some years, over 100% of the year over year growth in the digital ad spend was going to those two companies. So everybody else's piece of the pie was getting smaller and their pie was getting bigger plus they're eating a piece of ours. So, um, it, yeah. so those are things that can happen. So it's just really important to be aware of what's happening around you and then how does that create new opportunities and not to be rambling too much, but even with what happened with COVID-19, I'm still very close to the fitness space. Um, the fitness space was hit hard, right? You couldn't go into a gym anymore. And you saw some technology companies, but even these small like boutique gym owners be very innovative, very quickly, the ones that, that did well, where they started, they keep your membership and we will loan you pieces of our equipment that are just in our gym right now. So you have equipment at home and then we will do Zoom workouts to show you how to do a workout with the couple of dumbbells we could give you. Right. So they, they saw their equipment rather than as something that's going to collect dust in an empty gym as an asset that they can give out to their subscribing membership, keep them engaged and then just deliver their programming digitally. Right. Like really smart way to quickly pivot and, and leverage their know how plus the physical assets they had. Because if you tried to buy any fitness equipment, you couldn't do it. You know, there was a big run on all of that once everybody lost their ability to go to the gym. Um, so that was you know, that's that's part of business is, is seeing where there's, there's an opportunity to quickly leverage some assets that you have. So I was always very impressed by how quickly uh, the industry adapted where they could. Awesome. Um, so just to reiterate for those who aren't following with the chat, um, if you have a question that you'd like to send in, you can either like send it to me or you can just use the raise hand feature um, in participants and then I'll give you the floor. Um, but actually there's a question from Elena Stegman who you might infer is my mother. Um, she asks, so he and his companies um, have had to adjust to dramatic changes in markets. Um, a company's ability to execute adjustments like that rely heavily on having the right people. Can you talk about um, your talent and um, hiring strategy? Yeah, so um, well, with, with Stack, um, we had a co-founder who's actually a high school classmate of mine. So uh, you'll, you'll find there's a lot of co-founding teams that are good complements to each other. Um, so that helps. Um, but as we built out our team, because we were very, and if we always said a, a mission driven, now we probably would say purpose driven. Um, we wanted to know not just what somebody's 
raw skill sets were, but what their connection was to our mission. Um, and uh, part of, of that was just the authenticity that which they could speak to what we were doing, right? Um, we were trying to help educate younger athletes. So if you'd been an athlete, if you had felt those frustrations of not knowing what to do and have an appreciation for the, the, the mindset and the desires as well as the, um, the many different struggles with the time you have to do everything between being a student and an athlete that, that they would do better at their job. But they also, what was nice is they um, were a lot more resilient um, because they were connected to the purpose of what we were trying to do. When things did get tough, they weren't going to just cut and run because they believed in, in really like that, that higher purpose. It wasn't about how much ad revenue or how many users we reached or how many page views we generated. It was, we're helping athletes and we're going to make sure we, we're going to be able to do that. So um, I think it's, having that cultural fit and having that purpose fit is really important um, to, to have a team that's going to band together and weather those tough times. And, and we've done the same thing with, with Maha that um, my co-founders in that um, have both been in sort of purpose-driven businesses in the business of advising companies who are trying to be more purpose-driven. And you can tell those who are getting involved from, from an authentic standpoint versus those who just think it's a buzzword and they think that might be a, a get rich quick sort of scheme. Um, so the, again, the interviewing process has been much more about why they give a damn about like, what our purpose is. Um, certainly we wanna make sure some of the technical skills are there for whatever role they're gonna play, um, but making sure that there's that alignment on, on the higher purpose is, uh, has been really critical to making sure we're having the right, right team. Awesome. Okay. So um, kind of jumping back to what you sp spoke about um, in the last question, I'm wondering how has COVID-19 affected your current business? Um, and do you find that there's a like a resurgence in interest in, um, you know, dealing with social issues as part of their business due to the pandemic and sort of like, um, you know, new lens on sort of the underlying issues in our society? Or do you find that some of your clients are maybe trying to focus more on like the basics of their business and are sort of less interested in, in those things that they may consider like superfluous or? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say it kind of depends. And in, in some cases, it's just, it slowed things down in some areas as they're, you know, you got to make sure you're going to survive to the next day sort of a thing. But fortunately, unfortunately, a lot of the clients we have and the, and the prospective clients are, are larger organizations. So they're not, um, they're not in risk of failing, but they are trying just to make sure that they're responding appropriately financially. Um, and, and they're a little bit slower just to make decisions in general. So it's not like a big shift for us there. Um, but what we are seeing is that they are thinking about um, the, the value and the importance in the business case around purpose. So what's, what's emerging is, um, a lot of these organizations have de already determined who are their top performers. Um, and now they're trying to look backward almost, okay, this subset of our employees are top performers. This subset are lower performers. Is there anything with their alignment to our corporate purpose that's a commonality among the top performers versus the lower performers, right? What we're all hoping to see is those who most strongly connect with the company's higher purpose are end up being in that top quartile and the ones who either aren't aware of or don't really care about it or in the lower quartile, that helps them uh, make the case for why they should be spending more time hiring the right people or training those that are there to make them aware of what they're doing because as individuals become more connected to the, to the higher purpose of the organization, the better they perform versus if it's purely a economic monetary relationship, then you know, they're just mercenaries and they'll go work for the next company who offers them a dollar more. Um, and I think that's where these companies, they're, they're saying they want to make sure they're retaining the best talent. And with some rounds of layoffs and other things that are happening, um, there's a lot of talent that's out there. Um, and, and so, and, and some companies are going to be opportunistic to try to fill roles that they previously laid off uh, and try to poach. So the more that these companies can find how to really um, engage their employees on something that's more than just somebody offering them a bigger bonus the better chances they are, have of either acquiring or retaining the best talent. So, um, and then that's, there's, that's certainly part of it. You, you, then you look at, um, and from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint and things with George Floyd, um, I, think, I think the 
doing good as a business space is still a little bit murky. There's a lot of buzzwords and, and things like, you know, um, social impact, um, corporate activism, sustainability. These things are all kind of close cousins of each other, but a little bit different depending on who's defining them. And um, I, would, I would certainly say that there's something very different between an organization saying what their higher purpose is, like the, the, the positive impact they're trying to make on society because they exist versus activism where they might just be taking a position on some sort of political standpoint or, or policy limit per se. Um, versus from a sustainability standpoint of just making sure that the way the operate is doing as little harm as possible, right? Those are all very different things. They're, they're closely aligned and under like the broader umbrella of, of doing good is good for business. Um, but there, there's a little bit of nuance to the differences. Awesome. So um, Mandy, I think you had a question if you want to ask it. Sure. Hi, Chad. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Mandy Varley. I'm a PhD student in organizational behavior, um, and I also teach leadership. So what you're doing is highly interesting. Um, and I like the transparency in which you're engaging with the conversation around um, purpose and how you do that. Um, it's bringing to mind, like with great data comes great responsibility, especially when you're dealing with people. So to kind of contextualize my question, um, I'm thinking about so you have your organization's purpose, and then you have kind of the employee's life purpose. And uh, another thing that I do is I'm also an executive coach. So these two things may not always fully align with what you talked a little bit about. Um, and it's really great for organizations when employees are engaged and their purpose really aligns with the organization, but it doesn't always happen naturally. And if that doesn't really occur organically, it can become a situation where it's another performance metric that an employee needs to perform emotional labor to meet in order to protect their job, to secure promotions. You're touching on that in the hiring process where you can see that, but sometimes the employee is already embedded in the organization. Um, and given that your organization is predominantly using quantitative data, having a dashboard is really great. It can be rolled out in a lot of different great ways. Um, but how can you help your customers contextualize this information and use it in an ethical manner rather than punitively against employees? Sure, that's, and that's an excellent question. And, and certainly, yeah, we don't want it to be uh, used as a some mallet to bludgeon people over the head of get in line or whatever, right? People are gonna have the things that they care about. It's not always gonna be perfectly aligned with the organization. Um, we see, especially for larger organizations, in many cases, there's not just one thing that they care about or one activity. Um, so in some cases, um, you know, where we were talking to some folks with IBM, I'll just use them as an example. We talk, the, the layer of the organization where this is often most impactful is those mid-level managers where they've got a team of say, you know, six to eight people maybe that report up to them. And if I am your manager, Andy, and I find out that you're just very passionate uh, about, you know, say women in technology, right? And that that may not be something that we as a corporation, right, have deemed as part of our corporate purpose, but I know you care about that. And then I, I see that there's speaking opportunities at a women in tech conference, right? And I could bring that to you and say, hey, I know this is something that really is meaningful to you. Uh, would you be interested in this? Because they were looking for speaker, speakers from IBM for this conference, is this something you'd be interested in? And so um, it doesn't always have to be something that is, again, perfectly aligned with what the corporate purpose is, but recognizing as a manager that each individual on my team has the things that they're very passionate about, and there may be opportunities for me to give them an opportunity to act on that. Why would I not want to do that? Um, there's employee resource groups all over the place, right, where somebody first starting at a company may not be aware of all of them, um, and maybe it's something um, around, you know, gender equity or whatever it might be that somebody's passionate about, they can find, here's other people who care about that within the organization. Um, so those are ways where we, we try to give um, the organizations and the mid-level managers some ideas of specific actions they could be taking to support their folks, even if there's somebody's not personally as aligned with the top level that you could, there's still other folks within the organization or activities where you can't support them. So hopefully that answers your question a bit of how we try to be helpful there. 
So I'm hearing a lot about like um, providing ideas around job crafting. So like Amy Rizniowski's work there. Um, and then is there like specific training? Because I know a lot of HR folks, just because it's kind of my area, don't have a ton of training in data and statistics and people ops is growing. But mm -hmm. in terms of like how to utilize this data in a way that makes sense it is kind of it's not there yet. So it's like, here's a bunch of information, but people don't, on the organization side, don't always understand how to use it ethically. So I don't know, maybe yeah. that's another area to expand. <laughs> right, right. And so we've, we've dabbled a little bit in creating some um, some coursework, like, you know, as you're hitting on, sometimes we, we end up in the learning and development folks as a tangential group, because you see this as a way to, for career pathing, career development, skill development, and using um, some of what you learn about the employees and what they care about is in a, why they would want to now take a particular course. Um, and in some cases we'll, we'll create that in many more cases. Uh, we've been building out a network of some of those uh, service providers or experts or trainers and say, here's folks who can actually help on that. Or we'll create some, some digital course content with those folks and then can put it into the platform and that can get um, essentially nudged out to the employees based on how they responded that, hey, maybe you're gonna to wanna to take this or you, you suggest that to the manager. So um, that's kind of like stage two or three of an engagement. The initial phase is more about the measurement, understanding you know, from a, an aggregate level and even down to like the team level, how, what's kind of the, the baseline health check of purpose within your organization and what do those insights essentially tell us? Um, and then you stage two and three is more of how, what are some of the actions you should start taking to remediate those issues. It's kind of similar when we do emotional and social competency inventories as a coach. So that information shouldn't be used by organizations on whether or not they promote their people or don't promote their people. It's more of a feedback tool for people to learn and grow. Um, and it's not supposed to be delivered without a coach, but people do it. So there are still sometimes dodgy practices that happen within this sort of industry. So I look at that kind of an analogous example. But. Yeah, a great comparison. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you, Mandy. I think that's a great question. Um, so the sort of going back to something you touched on briefly earlier, um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, how you should sort of walk corporations through like the difference between um, change that they're making, maybe because there's a social issue that the sort of broader political climate requires them to take a stance on and really moving more towards change that, um, you know, is, is aligned with their higher purpose and also that they can sort of um, take actionable and measurable steps within their, within their business model. So more if you have any like sort of thoughts on like strategies to use for that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's critical to get that right. Um, it's not, easy and, it, and again it's kind of a murky area um there's I'm trying to pick my words appropriately here but like when you take in sort of a, an activist position on things let's say but it's nothing more than a platitude and just your ceo has come out and they've made this statement on on twitter and they sent out this letter but then there's no action behind it or the the action is we're just going to stroke a check right but their actual actions of what are their hiring practices? What are you doing to try to actually be solutions based and, and solve the problem rather than just throwing, you know, some token amount of money to, to some, some nonprofit? Like there's how most people are going to react to that will be very different. If somebody's actually able to show here's what we've been doing, um, either in how we've adjusted our hiring practices and the actual improvement we're making. And this is where, to your point, reporting is critical um, that, um, impact reporting, um, where you actually are defining um, what are, how are you measuring success, right? And what are the metrics that you're going to be using, and then actually reporting out on them. That's how you build some authenticity there that actually has meaning versus being opportunistic, right? And seeming like you're trying to take advantage of something rather than being authentically engaged with it. Or, you know, people unfortunately we'll make statements just because it's a little bit of a CYA situation. And if, well, I need to say something because if I don't, you know, then that's the, the silence is going to be looked at as a negative, but that'll kind of calm everybody down, but I'm not really going to do anything about it. And, and so that's where it's, it's, it's more um, 
And I think most of the backlash you will see where people really kind of step in it um, is they make some statement that isn't in line with or authentic to how they're actually behaving. And then it's very easy for somebody to find like, well, you're saying you're for this, but you don't have a single person of color on your board, right? Or you, you know, have an entire, you know, management team that is all, you know, homogeneous, right? And that's not, you know, you're saying this, you're, you're, you're pointing the finger at everybody else and, and you're not looking in the mirror about how you're behaving. And, and so um, actions, as cliche as it is, actions speak louder than words. And so if it's not um, something that you're going to be actively acting on and have the ability to show the results of what you're doing and it's just hollow words, then, you know, you're, you're probably hurting yourself in the long run. So that's, that's where the, a, a purpose a higher purpose that's done right is going to be in line with how you operate every day. And it's going to be core to what you're doing versus some statement you make once in a while when, you know, social unrest is, 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 is happening. So now we're going to just make the statement and we'll go back to doing whatever it is we want. Um, so we have a few questions from the Facebook live chat. Um, Lori Chan asks, how do you stay purpose driven given the increased popularity of competing media outlets? And do you feel pressure to follow trends that may deviate from your company's purpose? Right. And so I think this goes back to the same sort of a thing. If you know what it is you stand for and, and why, um, there's, there's an example that, that uh, somebody gave for a few different, it works in a few different areas, but just like the, the idea of um, being a, a diver versus a surfer. And um, if, if the water is essentially the social media or any sort of waves that are out there, right? If you go deep into something, right? The current really starts to become almost non-existent to you because you've gone deep and you really understand you're kind of anchored to what you're doing where if you're shallow and you're at the surface like a surfer, you can rocket it all over the place and you can also get crashed around quite a bit. And so if you're just at the top and you haven't really dug deep into why you're doing what you're doing and why you care about it, you're gonna be a surfer and all those different, the pressing issue of the time is just gonna knock you around all over the place, it's gonna be chaotic. But if you're a diver and you've gone deep onto something, it doesn't really matter what's happening up above at the surface, you've gone deep enough that you can actually stay controlled and you understand why you've gone there, but it requires you to take the time and the skill to get that depth. So um, I, I think that's just, it goes to the authenticity, but why you need to go beyond just the surface level on a lot of stuff. Awesome. So another question from Lori, um, what recommendations would you give to upcoming companies or entrepreneurs today because of the increased competition? So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a lot there. I, mean, I think there's a lot of, I think the new age of entrepreneurs who are typically thinking about what's, what's the other good we're going to do, whether it's, you know, a, a, like a Tom's shoes, you know, buy one, give one sort of a thing. There's other sock companies where they're thinking about some sort of a give back strategy there. Um, I think I might've shared with you. Um, well, before I get there, I'm just saying that I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs who from the core are thinking about, not just what's a, uh, a business idea that's gonna make me a lot of money, but that's actually going to impact other stakeholders beyond just you know, me, the owner, or the other, other shareholders, but it's about you know, it's stakeholder capitalism, if you're familiar with that term. And um, I think that's a, a, a good thing. And I think the more that a company thinks about all the different stakeholders from who, their customers, their employees, their suppliers, uh, their investors, the planet, right? If, how do we operate our business where we're positively serving all of them versus taking advantage of any one of them? That one, it, it makes your business a lot clearer and, and two, um, that can be a very nice competitive advantage both in why somebody might choose your product over somebody else's because you understand um, it's not just about um, the cost, right? Or some sort of value exchange there. Um, and it also will help you with recruiting the best talent because more and more people want to work somewhere that that's that has a soul and isn't just you know about the almighty dollar that there's other ways to get there i think that's great advice um michael i know you have a question sure thanks katie um Ted, i wanted to ask you a question one of the things um that both as sort of a new institute that we're struggling with as we kind of work with our students is just the 
the new platform, emerging platforms, um, whether it's a Zoom, whether it's a LinkedIn, um, obviously Facebook, TikTok, uh, mm -hmm. for as long as you've been, um, since you started Stack, um, obviously there's, there's platforms sort of emerge and go. And I'm sort of curious, like what advice do you have for entrepreneurs and also for students that are sort of looking to whether it's blogging, whether it's sort of communicating, you know, how do you kind of navigate platforms to make sure that when you have a, a, a product or service that sort of wants to get heard, or in the case of students, as they kind of market themselves, how do you, um, how do you sort of navigate? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few things in there. Um, one, I'll say uh, people can get, uh, kind of attracted to or, 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 or some of these snake oil salesmen, I'll say, so you gotta be everywhere, right? And um, you gotta be on yeah, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, right? You need to have your own blog. And before you know it, you could spend your entire day just making sure you're posting to all of those different platforms. And in most cases, that's not true. In most cases, um, you might only need one or two of those platforms. And um, depending on what it is you're trying to do, maybe it's a podcast and, you know, um, a website. And between the two of them, you can do what you need to do. Um, and you view the other social media channels as just the traffic sources. There are ways to get people to discover and see what it is you're talking about, but you're not really having to worry about, you know, building your platform on Twitter and having the biggest Twitter following possible. Um, so. I would say one, don't buy into the pressure of you have to be everywhere, get good at one or two of those. And, you know, over time you may want to layer in another one, but it's probably, if you're going to be video based, certainly you're going to want a YouTube channel, right? You could also make the case, well, you could put video up on Facebook or some of these other things, but YouTube is still a critical channel. Um, so uh, there's, there's that, but then I'd also say, and you, I mean, it's you, every, every day, it seems like there's some person in the media spotlight who eight years ago says something really stupid on a social media channel and that pretty much derails their career. And um, it's, you know, it's really sad when it happens, you look at it and you kind of roll your eyes, like, how could you have said something so insensitive or silly? Right. But you know what, if somebody had recorded everything that I said when I was 15 years old, I'm sure I would have said something at some point that I would look at really, you know, <laughs> embarrassed that I said it and whatever else. Right. But we're, when you're teenagers, you say some stupid stuff, um, you know, said some awful things to my parents. Right. <laughs> you know, like, um, so uh, just, you have to be really careful because it, it is there forever. Um, you know, unless you're going to spend all the time to go back and scrub that account. And um, so when, people are hiring, they are going to go to your social media accounts, right? They're going to try to find anything that's going to make you a hiring risk because the last thing they want to have on, you know, the news being, you know, employee at Google posts X, right? You know, that's, it's just going to be horrific for them. So you have to be really careful, like think that your grandma is reading everything that you're putting on social media. And is this what you want her to, to be seeing? And um, so that would be the other protective side. But the last thing I'll say on that too, though, is if you're trying to do any sort of, be in any sort of business where thought leadership or having an opinion, a professionally educated opinion is of value, um, it's never been an easier or better time for you to start sharing thoughtful, informative pieces of information, even if it's nothing more than curating what other thought leaders are saying and doing roundups and a little bit of perspective on it. But especially when I was running a media company, if somebody came in and, I, and they didn't have a portfolio of work, right, that was a pretty much dead right there. Because there was no reason they couldn't spin up a free WordPress blog and start creating content. There was nothing stopping them from taking out their cell phone and creating videos that they could post onto YouTube. So if you don't have the drive and the passion for our content topic or the ability or drive to actually start creating some of it and feel like it has to be published by some other company, the ability to self publish has never been easier and you should be doing that. Um, 
And uh, I, don't, I couldn't imagine an employer that would look at it as like, wait, you took the time to start a podcast or a YouTube channel or a blog about, you know, and, and environmental issues in business, right? Because you're passionate about it. And you once a month, you wrote another paper or article about that. Like, that's always going to be viewed as a positive thing um, and shows your commitment and passion to something. And the, the fact that you are somewhat entrepreneurial minded, because you're willing to go learn how to use those tools and create those things and start building an audience. So certainly would encourage you to do it. Just don't put stupid stuff up there. <laughs> That's really good advice. Um, so I'm sort of wondering if you ever work with companies where they maybe don't have as much of a defined sort of higher social purpose, and if you sort of ever um, work with them to sort of choose what that's going to be and where they want to you know move their business. Sure, and and really, so our our, our co-founder and CEO Hyder, that's that's where his space was. In many cases, he was going to organizations that had not yet defined it. Um, so that will be, uh, at times, some of the work we do. Um, we are looking at, like, as of yet, I mean, we're still fairly, fairly young. Um, as of yet, we've not been in that scenario, but we do pitch the idea that if you're at the point of needing to define what that higher purpose is, rather than it being the eight or 10 senior executives you brought into the room here, Maybe you should start by asking your employees and using some of the data that we can gather from them. So when you do pick whatever it is you're going after, you know that there's a large swath of your employee base that cares about that, right? And that even the act of asking is always helpful in building rapport and authenticity in what you're doing. Um, and, and so um, we think it's a, a terrific use case for the sort of data we can capture is to put that on the front and before the purpose has been defined. So you could actually find out, maybe you would have thought that what you um, was really important to you was something around oceanic relief or something like that. But then you talk to your employees and they were much more focused on access to education. And, and so rather than building this whole big campaign or a uh, new strategy around clean oceans and trying to remove ocean plastics, which, you know, as an aside, like it's a really cool thing that Adidas is doing where more and more of the uh, apparel and shoes that they're creating are from reclaimed ocean plastics, right? And they're just, they just have been able to align those and it's, it's awesome what they're doing. They've set up the processes and now, you know, people are buying their product, not just because you like the color of it or the design of it versus what they could get from, from Nike or, you know, some other shoe brand. It's, it's also that they know that they're cleaning up the ocean by doing running their business. And that's pretty cool that you can align those two things. But uh, again, Adidas might have uh, chosen that because a handful of people at the top thought that was the right thing, but maybe their employee base was not interested in that and would have been more enrolled around something else. So why not get that data first before you make that decision? That's really interesting. Um, so, and maybe we'll, to finish up here, but I'm really, really interested in how we as individuals can take, you know, what you've shared with us today and also how the work that you do around social purpose into our, our personal lives and into our sort of individual um, work lives. Um, and I'm wondering if you could give us some advice on like maybe how, especially as we move through like the next few, however long this pandemic extends, you know, how we can think more, more critically about our purpose as humans and as workers and members of a community. Yeah, um, so there's a few things. Uh, I mean, there's lots of different you know, books, as, as cliche as that is, around finding your own purpose, or you know, um, books like um, Conscious Capitalism, and, and um, which was by the you know, founders of Whole Foods, and um, was it Let My People Serve from the founder of, of Patagonia, um, where they give really good stories of how there was something that they were passionate about, and how they saw the value of focusing on all stakeholders and that's how it, they could align that with what they cared about, with how they operated a business and, and, and seeing how those systems work together sometimes can help give you clarity, just seeing that it, it works. Um, then um, something that we, we do actually, uh, so the United Nations has the uh, sustainable development goals. If you're not familiar with those, there's 17 of them and that, take your time to, to learn about them because they really, you know, they did a lot of work to try to boil down some of the biggest societal issues that the globe is dealing with and categorize them. Um, and 
And just seeing them in that sort of a taxonomy of these categories of issues and then learning what the underlying problems are and kind of like the subtopics within there. Um, so sometimes it's more of an awareness thing. You might not feel like you have a purpose yet because you're not really haven't looked at what all the potential problems are out there. And then as you learn more about them, one of them might really speak to you. Um, so that's, that's part of a process. We actually created a, a, a course to try to help one find their personal purpose. And one of the first steps is to, to spend to, sorry, to spend some time with the sustainable development goals and really look at those because we think it's just the, it's the, the cleanest way of, of talking about some of these big societal issues that um, you might want to get enrolled with. Awesome. So thank you so much for all your very edifying answers today and for everyone who asked, I think, really amazing questions. Um, I'm going to send it now back to Michael, who will finish it out. Great. Um, and Chad, thank you on behalf of uh, our Beal Institute and Case. Um, probably a bunch of uh, Case football players. If you were a CMU football player, I probably didn't, didn't love you on the other side of the uh, ball. But I'm glad you're on our team, you know, on the Cleveland team now. As we there you go. Big family. Um, but thanks for doing this. And, and you know, um, I think there's a lot of interesting lessons practical and, and philosophical lessons that we took out of today. It's great. Um, and look forward to meeting you in person sometime soon. I actually can't believe we've never met before, given how small <laughs> the world is and how many overlapping things we do. Just to share a couple of announcements about upcoming programs. Um, so next, actually tomorrow, um, we have a Weatherhead alum, Nick Neonakis, um, who's the CEO of a company called the Franchise Consulting Company. Um, Nick is doing some really interesting work, um, actually including some stuff he's doing in partnership with some folks on campus right now related to COVID-19 sort of contact tracing. So um, for those who are available to join at one o'clock tomorrow, I think you'll enjoy that. Um, next week, we have sort of a combination. We're, we're um, doing a series, as a number of you that are on the call know, we have a new program that we're offering this summer called a Remote um, Entrepreneurship Project Program. Um, and sort of in conjunction with that, we've got a cohort of about 110 students, although obviously the community is welcome. So on Tuesday, um, July 7th, so a week from today, we're going to do a thing um, with a woman named um, Lauren Head Deveni, um, part of our skills lab. Um, she is at, she's a, a Cleveland native, went to Western Reserve Academy, and she's going to do a program called LinkedIn, How to Rock the Profile. So based on some of the things that Chad was talking about today about blogging and communicating. Um, so that'll be on Tuesday and then next Wednesday. Um, and that Tuesday session is gonna be at two o'clock and um, just check the um, our website, the CWRU VL Institute. You can see information on all these programs. On Wednesday, we have a, a, a week from Wednesday, we have a, a session with our business librarian, Karen Oy, about business research resources. And then on Thursday, um, our good friend of Case Western Reserve, uh, Joe Keithley, uh, the former president of CT, CEO of Keithley Instruments um, is going to be part of our speaker series, and that'll be Thursday at one o'clock. So, keeping you all busy during these times of, um, of beautiful weather, but but coming inside to to share and learn together. So again, um, Katie, thank you for moderating today. Um, thanks to Elena, Katie's mom, for joining. I was it's always awesome to have the intergenerational folks joining. Um, and good seeing um, the, the rest of you as well. And Chad, thank you for, for spending time with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Katie. Great job.